There's so many places I want to start. I just don't have time to get to everything tonight. <clears throat> I have said, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. I have said many times now that the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament leads up to the first advent and the New Testament gives us the details not only the personal things that we need to understand where our salvation comes from and how we grow in faith in everything between Matthew and Revelation for our personal growth, but it's also a testament of what's prophesied that's leading up to a second advent. Now, the Old Testament does that for the first and second. The second advent, I mean, the New Testament does that strictly for what's going to be leading up to the very last sentence in the book of Revelation and, and the second advent when Jesus will come again. But Jesus spoke in many parables. Most didn't get them. Very few did. Very few do now. And you heard me right. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm not trying to put anyone down. But when, when it comes to, and it concerns prophecy, anything that concerning, concerning prophecy because of all the last days Christian science fiction nonsense is out there, most people can't see through the parables and what they're trying to communicate and their dual application, in some cases even more than dual applications. Luke 15 is no exception. I told you I will deal with the house of Israel and I showed you last week in Matthew 15 in fact I still have my note from it here where Jesus says in verse 24 but he answered and said I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel now let's read that again don't go to Matthew 15, 24, because that's not where I'm going tonight. But he answered and said, I am not sent, in parentheses, let's just put, to the Jews of the house of Judah. That's right. I am not sent to the house of Judah, but unto the law sheep of the house of Israel. Anyone that has any knowledge, any scholar that has any knowledge, concerning the differences between the house of Judah and the house of Israel, clearly understands or understood what Jesus was trying to communicate there. He came for the house of Israel. And parable after parable in the Gospels, you get the first application, which is mostly taught, and how that particular parable affects you And it causes you, to grow, causes you to grow in faith because you're going to draw something from that parable that does that. But you miss the additional application that Jesus was trying to communicate over and over. And I'll show you many different places eventually in the New Testament, including Paul's work, referring back to the house of Israel. To the house of Israel. The house of Israel is who? The northern kingdom, the ten tribes of the north. If you missed last, sun, uh, last Sunday night's program, catch up. I don't have time to review tonight. Now, one of the parables, or three of the parables, really. Go to Luke 15. This is about the lost sheep. And of course, most of you have been trained to think of only the lost sheep of all the sinners out there worldwide. And it does have application for that. I'm not saying it doesn't. That's the furthest thing from the truth, even though, even though I say that over and over again, I'll have people put words in my mouth saying, well, he's saying something else. No, I'm not. These particular parables have a dual application. Unfortunately, only one application is ever applied to it and how it affects you personally in your relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Here's the lost sheep parables. Let's just start with verse 1. I can see I'm not going to be able to get very far tonight, but I'll continue this. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for, for to hear him. All the publicans and the sinners to hear him. Okay. In addition to that, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, Actually, he spoke three parables. You see the parable, the first parable, about the hundred sheep, if you lose one, if you're not going to go rescue them. Then you have the parable of the lost coin, and you have the parable of the lost son. And what was the parable? Well, just to give you a simple definition for now, the parable is putting things side by side, in these case stories, side by side. Hopefully, something you can remember when you see the event or when the application is necessary to be applied at that time, you remember the parable and say, Aha, that's what Jesus was talking about. That's what Jesus was saying. That's what Jesus meant when he was giving these parables out, even though, like I said, right over their heads for the most part. Now, I'm not going to talk about the first parable. I'm not going to even refer to the second parable, even though they're all related, saying the same thing, really. But how many times we read the parable of the lost son and just put a personal spiritual application to it? Well, let's put something else to it tonight, but let's read the story first. And he said... A certain man had two sons. Two sons? Why two sons? Why could it be three sons and only one son went crazy? Why not four sons and one son went crazy? Why not two sons, one daughter, and one son went crazy? Why not 12 sons? Remember, this is a parable. Jesus said, and he said, a certain man had two sons. Circle that. Two sons. And the younger of them said to his father. The younger of them said to his father. The younger son said to his father. Remember that. Give me the portion of goods that fall to me and divide it unto them, and he divided them unto his living. Okay, this is for you, one son, and to the other. This is for you. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. He separated from the other son from his homeland. And there wasted his substance or possessions with riotous living. With riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would vain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? Now, most of you just think about food here. Materialistically, what a body needs to nourish itself. But I want you to think about the spiritual application also, not just on a personal level, but this particular son, when he separated from his homeland, from his father, even though this didn't happen, I want you to start 
understanding where I'm going with this story. Even though he divorced himself from his homeland, is he divorced himself from his family, in this case, by choice. See, when Ephraim and the northern tribes rebelled and started setting up false places of worship, worshiping false gods, a golden calf, a sun and moon god type of religion again, God cursed him. God sent him to bondage those tribes. God separated himself. He gave him a bill of divorcement. They were not called his people any longer. And I will rise and go, but then it says, I will rise after he figures out the situation that he is in. I will rise and go to the Father and will say unto the Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I have missed the mark. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. And that's exactly what happened to Ephraim. When I say Ephraim, the house of Israel, they were no longer worthy to be called the bride. The house of Israel, because God divorced them. God divorced them. But Christ came back to die on the cross to pay the vow, not just for man's sins, but for the house of Israel. So it can remarry once again back to the Father, back to God, back to a righteous connection, someone that's right with God, in this case a nation right with God, the nation, I mean the people, the called ones out of that nation, not all the nation, but God does work through nations and people. And I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hard servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. He was a great way off. But his father saw him and had compassion and ran. And fell on his neck and kissed him. He covered him with kisses. For Christ's sake, he covered us with his blood, including the house of Israel. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servant, Bring forth the best robe. Bring forth the best robe. And put it on him, and put a ring on him, his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead. Was dead. And that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. Not the house of Judah, but the nation of Israel. The house of Israel, the house of Joseph was dead and is alive again. Why? What was it? But he answered and says, I am not sent to the Jews of the house of Judah, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And of course, the Jews not believe not because ye are not my sheep and other scriptures in John. And he's speaking of the Jews at that time, at that point. They will be, but not yet, and still not now, except for a very few, that the door is wide open for the ones that do see the truth of the gospel. But the majority, no, it's not happened. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. You see the dual application here that Jesus is communicating? Not just a personal story and how you can fall away from God, but if you run back to him, 
and his compassion and mercy will take you in. But he's also talking on a national level to the house of Israel, who he came to rescue. Who he came to remarry and be his bride once again. Who he came to say and declare, you are not my people, but now you are once again. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost. Yes, those tribes were lost. The house of Israel is lost and is found. That's why Christ said, go to those nations, not the Gentiles, those nations that house the house of Israel, the house of Joseph, the house of Ephraim, which then would be the light bearers of this world, the gospel message. And they began to be married. Mary. Now his elder son, Judah here in this case, in this application, that I'm giving you tonight, is the elder son, was in the field. See, he wasn't lost. And now found. The Jews have never been lost. They might have, after 70 AD, dispersed, but they never were lost. The house of Israel was lost, but the Jews were never lost. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. A sacrifice was made because the brother was received safe and sound. Christ made that sacrifice for the house of Israel and for anyone else that wants to open their heart to the gospel message. But the direct message is to the house of Israel. And he was angry. Of course, in this case, Judah was angry. And even though it doesn't say Judah here, but the house of Judah. And would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. I'm the one who didn't lose myself. I came back after the bondage of 70 years. Not all, by the way. A very small portion chose to come back. I think I'm faithful. How come he's getting a party? And he was angry, would not go in. Therefore came his father out and treated him. And he answered, saying to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. They don't think they transgressed the law. And yet thou never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. What a jealous brother. But as soon as this, as this son was come, which had devour, devoured the, thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him that fatal, fatted calf. Think about it. But as soon as this son, thy, or this thy son, Paint a picture, the house of Israel, the northern tribes. As soon as those people come around now and are rescued and are accepted back in, as part of the bride, which, by the way, he devoured the, thy living with harlots. With harlots. Isn't that what the northern kingdom did? I don't have time to go through all the Old Testament in this story. That's exactly what they did. Harlots and idolatry. 
they were told not to mix with the crowd. Mostly the Assyrians in that, in that time and Canaanites, and that's exactly what they did. They mixed in. Look what happened. Ahab, remember Ahab? I preached on him many times. Look what happened when he hooked up with Jezebel. But as soon as thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him that fatted calf. <coughs> and he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead. Was dead. Now, this brother never died in the story on a personal application, but the house of Israel was dead to God. And we'll get to all those chapters in the Old Testament that proves that out. This is the dual application of this parable. It's side by side with, with certain stories for a reason. Not just for a personal application, but of an application that Christ, over and over, if you know how to look for it and see it and verify with God's word what he's trying to get across, why he was here. I came for the house of Israel, the lost sheep in it. And anyone else that benefits from the gospel, from my death and resurrection, that's even the more the merrier. But specifically, I came for the house of Israel. I know I'll be rejected by that. I know I'll be criticized by saying that. But when I'm all said and done, I want you to prove me wrong. Just like anything else I preach on. We're a long way from solidifying this introduction of this story. But I'll get there. So don't rule anything out yet. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. And was what? Was lost. And is found. The house of Israel was lost, but now it's found because Jesus searched it out and commissioned his disciples to get the message to them. And that's exactly what they did. When you look at Luke 15, and basically all these three stories, and if you understand the meaning of these parables concerning the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, they're all saying the same thing. The younger saw the younger saw the younger son lost his identity. He lost his identity. And that's exactly what happened when they once they released from the bonds they were in and they went through that Caspian Sea area, through the Caucasus Mountains and other locations, they lost their, their identity. They were no longer called Israelites. They became known as many different tribal people, the more popular one, the Celts. The younger son, in this case, the house of Joseph being the younger son, lost his identity while his older brother, Judah, Judah, Remember the younger son, verse 12. And the younger son of them said to his father. You see in the connections, folks? You see in the dual application Jesus has? A parable just doesn't have one certain meaning. Many of them don't. There's so many different applications. Most of them have at least dual applications of what Jesus is trying to communicate. about things concerning what was to come, because he did come in that first advent. The younger son lost his identity, while his older brother, Judah, looked after what? He stayed behind. He took care of business. 
He even came back. The land. He looked after the land. And today they are still looking after the land. And they're still holding the commandments. Unfortunately, the law But if you look at scriptures such as Ezekiel 37 and latter part of it and Jeremiah 31 and all those scriptures I will get to, they are still looking for Ephraim to return. For Ephraim to return. I hesitated whether to go in this direction in Psalm 83 about the hidden ones because I knew I had to spend so much time I just want to, don't want to teach about the lost tribes like some of you already heard. Nothing wrong with it. Excellent in some cases. Some heard it from one preacher, some heard it from another. But it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't tie in all of Scripture, including Jesus and then Paul, to identify the markers in Scripture about who Jesus is referring to and the reason why he came. One of the reasons. And he's yet not done with the house of Israel. He is alive again. And he was lost. And he is found. He is found. Let me read you something. I might have time. Jewish tradition sometimes referred to two redeemers, each being called Messiah. Both of these redeemers are involved in delivering the Jewish people. Of course, that's Jewish tradition. Remember, they, they think, Jewish people think the house of Israel is Jewish. It's not Jewish. From exile and ushering the long-awaited Masonic era. That's their mistake. These two messiahs are called Messiah ben David, Messiah, the descendant of David, and Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah, the descendant of Joseph, respectively. When Jews typically think of the Messiah, however, they generally have in mind Messiah ben David of the tribe of Judah, who shall rule in the Masonic age. That has not yet come to pass. Pass. It hasn't, folks. Period. Messiah ben Joseph is said to be of the tribe of Ephraim, son of Joseph. No, he's not. He's still from Judah. But the Messiah ben Joseph, in its right application, means he came to rescue the house of Joseph. And is also sometimes called Messiah ben Ephraim. Messiah ben Joseph will come first before the advent of Messiah ben David. It's still only one Messiah. But he came as Messiah ben Joseph to rescue what? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the ten tribes. The northern kingdom. Messiah ben Joseph will come first before the advent of Messiah ben David to prepare the world for the coming of the kingdom of the Lord. The rabbis derived this understanding of Messiah ben Joseph from the exegesis of Obadiah 1.18, which I'm not going to go into right now. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Moreover, they understand the confrontation with the house of Joseph and the house of Esau to be preconfigured in the birth of Joseph himself, where Rachel indicated that God would add a son who would be anointed for battle in the end of days. Now, that's Jewish tradition. I don't agree with all that, but I'll get to that. And, of course, Jewish tradition thinks that he will be killed because of that war. And they're off. 
that's a Jewish tradition just as bad as the Christian science fiction theories. Fascinatingly, fascinatingly, another rabbi has said that the Jewish people may be redeemed immediately if they simply repent, which some did, even for the appearance of Messiah Ben David. But if they do not repent, great tribulation will come them. Another rabbi used the Messiah Ben David which is a traditional Jewish view, by the way, is said that he will restore the temple, regather the exiles of Israel, cause all Goheem nations, not Gentiles, of the earth to be subject, subjected, put an end to sin and evil, raise the dead, and set up a blissful utopia headquartered in Jerusalem. In that day, the earth shall be filled with knowledge and the glory of the Lord as the, as the waters cover the sea. And of course, they get that from Habakkuk. Does the Tanakh give evidence of two messiahs or just one? Is it possible that the portrayal of the Messiah as riding a donkey, lowly and humble in Zechariah 9, 9, and you see in the gospel record as Jesus enters Jerusalem, and the portrayal as one coming in great triumph in the clouds, as in Daniel 7, refer to the same person? Could it be that one messiah would come twice? First as Ben Joseph to atone for the sins of Israel and the nations. This is why it's so important, why I return to the teachings on was Joseph and Hoptep. There is no greater figure in the Old Testament that demonstrates as clear why there was one Messiah for two different purposes, one Ben Joseph and one Ben David. But I'll get to that. Could it be that one Messiah would come twice, first as Ben Joseph the atone for the sins of Israel and the nations, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, which I'll get to, not just on a personal level, but also through a house of Israel viewpoint. And second, as Ben David to bring judgment upon the unjust and to restore the kingdom back to Israel at the end of all time. Yeshua, as Ben Joseph, indeed came first and suffered and died for the sake of Israel and the nations. I, like, I want to say the house of Israel and the nations, including any Jews that acknowledged the grace that was given as a free gift to them. Moreover, after his death, great calamity and tribulation indeed broke out in Israel, and the second temple was destroyed, and the nation was forced into a long period of exile. In fact, ever since he was pierced for Israel, no temple has ever stood on Mount Moriah, the place of the original location, the place where he, has, he was offered to make atonement for sins. Yet, Yeshua as Ben David will completely fulfill the Masonic expectation and as, it, as anticipated by the Jewish sages. He will come again to restore the temple and set up his kingdom upon the earth. I'll have more to say about that in the future. Moreover, he will unite all the goyim, the nations in peace, raise the dead, and set up the throne in Jerusalem. In that day, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As Masonic Jews, we believe that Yeshua is both Messiah ben Joseph, the suffering servant at his first coming, and Messiah ben David, the reigning king at his second coming. And that's the accurate view, by the way. And I'll point to scriptures in Isaiah and in Psalms to point that out, hopefully in the future. He is also the anointed prophet, priest, and king as foreshadowed by other in the Tanakh, other messiahs in the Tanakh, other messiah in the Tanakh. Like so many other prophecies given in the scriptures, the prophecies concerning the messiah are dual aspect with both a near and a far meaning and a ready but not yet fulfillment. It is common for Jewish objectors to point that Jesus has not fulfilled all the prophecies and to scorn the suggestion that some prophecies are for a later time and, and are to be fulfilled at the second coming. The fact is, however, the prophecies about Messiah are of two seemingly mutually exclusive types, as though they were talking about two different messiahs. 
Jewish scholarship refers to Messiah ben David and Messiah ben Joseph. One is the positive, victorious Messiah who ushers in the kingdom of peace, and the other is a suffering servant. Example, Isaiah 53. The popular tendency is to think only of Ben David and ignore Ben Joseph. But the Messiah slash Christian view accounts for both in one person. Well, not most Christians even think about that. Think, think about it that way. Or about it that way. Interesting, these two prophetic strains are named for David and Joseph, both of which suffered first and emerged victorious in the end. Joseph is introduced to us with dreams of grandeur, but he was lost to Israel. Remember, Israel is his father. Actually considered dead before his dreams came true. Eventually, however, he had a second coming when he came back into the lives of his brothers who once rejected him. Then they bowed down to him and became the savior of his people by providing for them in time of famine. David also, although anointed as king in his youth, as far as God was concerned, was rejected by the current king and lived as a fugitive for many years before he finally became the quintessential king of Israel. Both of these historic figures, which, which Jewish tradition has recognized as being prototypes of Messiah, arrived amid promises and pushed down and finally emerged in glory. Shouldn't the ultimate Messiah follow the same pattern? It is helpful, for instance, in considering the life of Joseph as a type or a pattern for the other son who would be the fulfillment of Messiah ben Joseph. Let's just give you some examples. And I've done this before, but I'll just give you quickly for the next few minutes some examples. The birth of Rachel's son, Joseph, would remove reproach from Israel. Remember, she couldn't have any children, and she finally had Joseph. As far as Jesus is concerned, the birth of Yeshua, Yeshua was for the glory of the people of Israel. Yeshua would also be the light to the nations. The name Joseph means, may he add, a wordplay given by Rachel to express her hope for more children. Jesus, Yeshua, means Yahweh saves and denotes the deliverance of God's children. Through Yeshua, God would add children to Israel. Joseph was the firstborn son of Rachel. Yeshua was the firstborn son of Mary. Joseph was a precarious young man who was filled with dreams given to him from heaven. Yeshua was at the temple discussing Torah with the sages when he was 12 years old. He was a he was a child who was filled with dreams of heaven. Joseph was beloved of his father in Genesis 37, 3. He was ben Yaqid, as Isaac was regarded by Abraham. Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased in Matthew 3, 17 and 17, 5. Yeshua also is described as ben Yaqid, only begotten of the father. All coincidences, I guess. I'm just reading you some of them. There's many. Joseph was raised in the promised land. Yeshua was raised in the promised land. Joseph brought a bad report of his brothers to his father. Yeshua testified that the world hated him because its works were evil. Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons. God loves Yeshua, his son, in a unique way, which you can find in the Gospel of John, Matthew, and Luke. Joseph prophetically foresaw himself as the deliverer of Israel and the savior of the world. Yeshua understood himself to be the savior of Israel, the house of Israel, and the world. Joseph's brothers hated him and could not speak kindly to him. Yeshua was hated without a cause and repeatedly tested by the religious authorities. Joseph was a dreamer and a prophet who, despised, who was despised by his brothers. Yeshua preached the message of salvation through his vision of the kingdom and was despised. Joseph's brothers refused his rule. Yeshua had likened his rejection by the religious leaders to mean, quote, we do not want this man to rule over us, under quote, Luke 19, 14. Joseph's brothers envied him. 
Jesus, it was out of the envy that the chief priest handed him over to be killed. Joseph was sent forth by his father. Remember in Genesis 37, 12, to seek his brethren? Yeshua was sent forth by his father. And of course, you see that throughout the gospel records and in some of the epistles. Joseph's brothers conspired to kill him. The chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Yeshua in order to bring about his death. Joseph's brothers disbelieved in him. Yeshua's brothers did not believe in him. Joseph's brothers stripped him of his tunic and mocked him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, speaking of Jesus in Matthew 27. Joseph's brothers cast him into a pit, a symbol of a tomb. Yeshua was cast into a pit. Joseph's brothers callously ate a meal while he was suffering in the pit. Israel ate the Paschal meal while Yeshua was in the pit. Judah promoted the idea that Joseph's life should be Judah promoted the idea that Joseph's life should be ransomed. Yeshua was born of the tribe of Judah and became the redeemer of the world. What a coincidence. Joseph's brothers sold him for shekels of silver. As far as Jesus is concerned, they paid him, Judas that is, 30 pieces of silver. Joseph was raised from the pit. Yeshua was raised from the dead. Joseph was sold as a slave before he was promoted to glory. Yeshua took upon himself the form of a suffering servant before his exaltation. Joseph was taken into Egypt to avoid being killed. Jesus was taken to Egypt to avoid the insane wrath of Herod the Great. Joseph's tunic was covered with blood. Yeshua's robe was covered with blood. Yeshua redeemed us from judgment by shedding his blood for our sins. Joseph became a slave in Potiphar's house. Yeshua took, up, took upon himself the form of a suffering servant before his exaltation. The Lord was with Joseph in his, in his humiliation and prospered him. Yeshua grew in wisdom and favor. He always did those things that pleased the Father. Joseph was made an overseer. Yeshua is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. Go to 1 Peter 2.25 for that. I've been there many times. Joseph was tempted but, not, but did not sin. Yeshua was tempted in every way, yet was without sin. Joseph was falsely accused, and indeed the Torah does not attribute any sin to him. Yeshua was falsely accused by the religious authorities. A few more. Joseph was in prison with two other criminal, criminals. You find that in Genesis 40, verses 2 and 3. Two other also were criminals, were led away to put to death with Jesus. Joseph was a prophet who could interpret dreams. Jesus was a prophet who could reveal what was hidden in the heart. In Genesis 41, 38, 39, Joseph was filled with the Spirit of God and great wisdom. God anointed Yeshua with the Holy Spirit and with power. He was full of wisdom and truth. Joseph was finally vindicated and exalted over the entire world. The Son of Man is seated at the right hand of, the po right hand of power. Joseph was raised from the pit and given fine linen and gold. Yeshua was clothed with his pre-incarnated glory after the resurrection. Pharaoh ordered the royal criers to walk in front of Joseph's chariot, shouting, Bow the knee! Every knee shall bow to Yeshua the Messiah. You find that in Isaiah, Romans, and other places in the New Testament. There's so many, I just don't have time to read them all. 
Joseph was 30 years old when he was began his public ministry in Egypt. Yeshua was 30 years old when he began his public ministry in Israel. God sent Joseph to become bread giver to preserve a remnant upon the earth. God sent Yeshua to be the bread of life that preserves a remnant upon the earth. Judah intercepted the, on behalf of Israel's sons, Benjamin, before Joseph. Yeshua one day inter intercede as Messiah ben David on behalf of Israel that's there now, the house of Judah. The Jewish people will finally repent and turn to Yeshua as the Savior. A couple more. Joseph was revealed to his brothers as Israel's Savior. Yeshua is Israel's true Savior. Israel received Yeshua as the second coming. Joseph became the Savior of the entire world. God sent his only Son in the world so that he, we might have life through him. Salvation ultimately means redemption from the curse of sin and death. Joseph was alive from the dead for Israel. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Speaking of Jesus. Judah led the way of Israel back to the promised land of Goshen. Yeshua as Messiah ben David will lead Israel to the renewed land of promise. Joseph was crowned with glory and honor. Yeshua was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of his death on behalf of his people. Joseph was given the blessings of the firstborn son. Yeshua is the firstborn of creation who has preeminence over all, the, over all other prophets, priests, kings, and angels keys priests kings and angels that's why i've taken the time to go back again and look at joseph that's why it's important it's important to understand that there is one messiah but two different purposes a purpose for the first advent and a purpose for the second advent christianity likes to bunch it all together and not think through it because it might rattle some cages. Well, I want to know what the truth is. I want to rightly divide the word of God. And to do that, you have to understand the prophetic identities of these people. The house of Israel, the house of Judah, the house of Jacob. You have to understand what I covered last, no last Sunday night, that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came... And what was once dead is now alive again, as I just read you the parable, because what Jesus did. You know, I'll cover more about the two messiahs and the two comings, but it's important that you understand in this brief further introduction why the house of Judah did not believe. Because Jesus' own words said, because you are not my sheep. Well, they wanted a Messiah, but they wanted Messiah ben David. He came as a suffering servant as Messiah ben Joseph to fulfill the, first, to fulfill the prophecies and the purpose of what that first event would fulfill and complete. By the time he died and rose again. There's so much to go over, folks. I know this sometimes can be boring to many because you just like sometimes hearing all the juicy stuff and the messages and the faith and messages and so forth and the dates and the timelines. You'll never understand the complete knowledge of what these lost tribes in 
history, both Old Testament and New Testament, significance is in these last days, unless you know where they went, why they went there, and now why they're back, and what their fulfillment, still not yet totally fulfilled, promises of what's still to happen concerning both the house of Israel and the house of Judah, what has to be accomplished before his return. I told you many times over, there's a lot to cover in this last day series. We're not even close. I'll spend many, many months probably on this particular subject, and I'll still leave it very incomplete. I plan to give you enough information where you can distinguish between the two different houses, the two different purposes, and whom Jesus was speaking to and referring to in his first advent. If you missed that, you missed probably the most important part of the Lost Tribes teaching in the house of Israel. You got it? Now, I plan to continue, but now... It's your turn to talk to me. I had a few more people respond financially about what they're going to be giving by the end of the month. I want to hear from the rest of you now. I want to reach this 15,000 goal. I want to get to $30,000 a month. I want to be able to sit here more nights a week so we could push along. We are so far behind, not just in this subject. There's, there is at least 10 more series I'd like to start things you think you might have heard and know all about. But knowing what I presented to you, I guarantee you there'll be eye-openers in those series also. But I can't get there unless you get me there. I'm doing everything I can on my own, on the outside, to keep this going, plus the $15,000 a month budget. But I need to get the thirty. But let's get to 15 first. Now, the rest of you respond. Now, I just threw a parable at you to show you the dual application of what Jesus was continuously communicating, not just on a personal level for spiritual growth, but also for the reason why he came is to rescue the house of Israel. Also, if you catch that, if you, excuse me, if you caught that, but I want you to allow, I want you to take now a few minutes and let me know, please.